Join me in prayer. Father God, I thank you for your word today. Lord, on a day where on a day where we talk about you being light and how without your light, Lord, we're still walking in darkness. Lord, I just pray that you would illuminate, illuminate our hearts and our minds as we come before your word. If there is a veil that is before our eyes when it comes to the things of you, Lord, I pray that you would lift that veil so that we could have full understanding, not, not so we can live some enhanced life that furthers our personal agendas, but so that we can shine your light in a world that is dealing with heartbreak, brokenness, relationship issues, financial issues, whatever it is that gives people discouragement. Lord, may we as your people walk into those arenas and shine your light. May we be your ambassador. So Lord, it starts with us. It starts with your word. Holy Spirit, do the work that only you can do. Help us to be the people that you've called us to be. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So Thursday morning, I'm kind of going about my normal routine, and right around a quarter after nine o'clock, my uh, phone starts lighting up, and I'm getting these strange texts, and they're all kind of saying the same thing. Are you okay? Is everything all right? And of course, you know, when this begins, I, I don't even know what anybody's talking about. I, at nine o'clock, I was between here and uh, I, was, I had left Pella, and I was coming up here uh, for my, just kind of my normal schedule, and I hadn't heard anything, I hadn't known anything, and at that particular time, uh, it comes to my attention that a vehicle had driven through the main entrance at the Walmart in Pella. And of course, there's, there's multiple casualties, nobody really knows what's going on, and uh, nobody really knows uh, you know, who, the names of the people that had been killed. And so... I'm just kind of getting caught up on everything. But as this is happening, and as these things are kind of coming to my attention, and I, you know, of course, I'm responding back, yes, I'm okay, why? Why do you ask? As all this is going on, I'm just reminded once again, yet again, another year. Uh, again, this, th these are tragic circumstances, but these things happen this time of year, and, and, you know, we have all these uh, promises or maybe even expectations. And then we have the reality that kind of runs parallel to these things. For example, we know we're in the Advent season. We know, perhaps we do, maybe if you're a visitor at church, you're not familiar with what Advent is. Advent is the season. Uh, in it, 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 so many ways, it kind of kicks off the, minute, the, the liturgical year of the, of the traditional church. Uh, Advent is the season of reflection and preparation that, that precedes Christmas, or uh, in, in, uh, theologically, the incarnation of, of God as one of us. So Advent is this idea, we, we focus on the coming of Jesus, the first coming, but then we, kinda, we also associate the second coming. I've talked to you before about how we're in between, we're in this era between Advents. What we celebrate traditionally at Christmas time is the first advent. The promised coming of God to be with us and to dwell among us. But we have the promise of a second advent. And so as a believer, here we are in this place uh, surrounded by just tough circumstances. And, and what gives us hope? In those circumstances, it's this idea that, there's, that Jesus is coming back. We're not quite there yet. But what we do get offered up this time of year is this endless parade of, of uh, imagery. This endless parade of secular uh, things that are supposed to bring us joy and happiness. And you kind of associate that typically with what our traditional understanding of those things are. And somewhere in the midst of it, there's a disconnect. Do you know one of the themes of Advent is joy? Tell that to the families that lost their loved ones. Tell that to, 
to these families, and, and not just the ones in Pella, but, but all over, that are going to be having their first Christmas without their loved ones, that one of the themes of Advent is joy. And see, there's, there's like this disconnect. And so what we've done this year as a church is we have been, we've gone into this idea of light uh, because it never ceases to amaze me. I, uh, many of you know this about me, but as I was, I mean, I grew up in a very traditional church circumstance and I went through my decade of rebellion where I just kind of said to the church, this is nonsense. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And, and then as I kind of re-came back, as the Lord was working in my heart, I came back to the church but what, I, but what I did, what I found that was very interesting, I started to ask questions. And I found that a lot of people that went to church, they didn't have a clue what any of this stuff meant. It was just something we always did. So, so kind of my heart as a pastor, uh, we, we're going to embrace these things, but I want you to know what they mean. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, what does that mean? If, if you talk to Christians... That are that traditionally have gone to church and you know they love they put, even put Christmas lights on their houses and and you know for example when they when they had uh, the the they had a, a candlelight vigil at Walmart Friday uh, Friday evening at seven o'clock and what what's the association of all that and and so what I want is I want you as a people to understand what does it mean when Jesus says I'm the light of the world. And what does it mean for you personally? Uh, and so we've been kind of exploring, and we are going to continue to explore throughout Advent, this whole idea of light. Now let me remind you where we started last week. Uh, what, what does light versus darkness mean uh, as it's used in this example? Could you pull up that first slide, light versus de- darkness? So in mo- so many cases in Scripture, uh, it kind of refers, when it refers to light and uh, you know, God is light and, and things like that, what is it ultimately talking about? Well, kind of on, our, on the thinking idea, uh, it kind of brings this contrast between truth and lies. Now, we know that, that the, the human condition, according to Romans chapter 1, is that we are lost because we have traded the truth about God for lies. So part of, of God being the light is leading us back on a path of truthfulness. Now, what's important is that because we traded the truth about God for lies, Scripture makes it very clearly that God has abandoned us to darkness and misunderstanding. And eventually, just like any other relationship, you walk in the wrong direction long enough, you lose your understanding of who the other person is. And so, so much of, of Jesus referring to himself as the light is this idea of, of God illuminating the truth. This is who God is. It's not lies that the world gives us. One of the, this is a little bit of a bunny trail, and I hope I don't offend anybody here, but can I tell you what is probably one of the most classic examples of this? I'm going to mention a book that's being made into a movie called The Shack. Can I just tell you that theologically, if you come, if you come before that book is fiction, great. But if you come before it as theological illumination, I'm going to pray for you. Because it's garbage. Okay? And I just, I just want to put that out there. So, so all, all these people are going to read this book and they're going to think it's going to give them some revelation about God and, and then they're going to go to the movie and think it's going to give us some revelation about God. There's nothing rooted in biblical truth about this book. Uh, it's, just, it's just fiction. And so, uh, you know, I read the book, and, you know, if you want to read the book, maybe you've never even heard of the book, but it's going to be coming out in a movie. It was like a national best, bestseller, and one of the reasons why, why so many Orthodox Christians have a problem with this book is because it presents this picture of God that isn't true. But people, people buy it, and they, look, they say, oh, this is awesome. Yeah, except it's not true. It's not what it really is. And so we live in this state of darkness when it comes to who God is. And so we're willing to kind of gravitate towards anything that people will feed us that we like. What we need to gravitate towards is what God tells us about the truth. So that's kind of, that's kind of intellectual. So the other part to this uh, is, is, is kind of governing. I, I'm not talking about government. 
I'm talking about authority. I'm talking about governing things that God puts in our lives. And it's this idea that when God talks about light, he's talking about order and chaos. And, and just so you know, we as a people, we, we kind of, we're, we're, we're so living in darkness, we're so used to living in, in darkness, that, that we, we live in, in chaos. But every time God puts order, uh, it, it's kind of foreign to us. So order can feel like chaos. It's not uncommon for when people come to the Lord that they feel like their lives go into chaos. But what's happening is, is God is organizing and making order out of their lives that were already chaos. But it feels different. So, so that's kind of another picture. Now the third one is the spiritual. Uh, when it talks about light versus darkness, it's talking about the glory of God, His holiness, the radiance of God, Versus sin and disobedience. So when we talk about darkness, it's, 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 it's the result of sin and disobedience. Now I want to take you to our text today. Uh, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 4. And I'm going to read for you, uh, and then we're going to kind of uh, go back and unpack this. But we'll start by reading it. Uh, we're going to begin in 2 Corinthians 4, starting with verse 1. It says, therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God, and all who are honest know this. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. So you see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. And we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. So, so uh, Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, He's painting this picture of light, but he brings something kind of interesting into it. He brings in this picture of a veil. And it, it's this idea of, of something that, that kind of obscures the light. Um, I, you know, I, I, when I kind of think of a veil, kind of a modern equivalent, uh, when I've traveled, like when I, we flew to Africa and, or we flew to the Middle East, you know, that's a long flight and and oftentimes, you know, you're there for several hours, and sometimes uh, it's daylight the whole time that you're traveling. And, you know, only, when, you, when you travel back from Europe or Africa, you can travel all day and literally step off the plane, and it's only like an hour or two later than when you first took off. So one of the things they give you are those little <laughs> airline, you know, the, the blinders that they give you, kind of a veil, uh, so that you can sleep. Uh, even though it's daytime out. And this is the reason why everybody gets so messed up and traveling back. But it, it, it blinds you to the light. And so when they talk about this veil, uh, maybe, you know, whatever a veil may be, but this is, this is what I think is important to think about. It's anything that can, that can cover the light. So it keeps out the light so, uh, so that people can be in darkness. And so when Paul is talking about this veil, he's talking about people's reaction to the light. Some people see it, other people don't see it. And the reason why they don't see it is because there's a veil. Now why is that so important? Well, it's important first of all because it's important for those of you, us, that do see it to understand why others don't. It's not because we're superior or we're better or that somehow, someway we're smarter than people that get it. It means that God has removed a veil of understanding. And so what we're to do 
is we are to speak of the light, we are to speak of the truth about who God is, and if people don't get it, hopefully at some point God will lift that veil. One of the great ironies about the gospel itself is that it's only in the presentation of the gospel that the veil is lifted. But you don't know whether or not it's going to be lifted until you speak it. See, sometimes you can speak to you can speak to a hundred people, and maybe one person gets it, and the others don't. But the way that the person that got it got it was by the presentation of the gospel. We'll keep we'll we'll, we'll explore that. We'll keep we'll keep unpacking that. I want to take you first of all. I want to take you to uh, uh, John chapter eight or John eight. And uh, this is a very familiar passage, and all of you know it. Uh, it says, um, uh, Jesus, John 8, verse 12, I referenced this that last week. It says, uh, John 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke to the people once more, and he said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness, because you will have the light that leads to life. Now, if you're like me, and you, and, and you kind of make little notes in your Bible, I would say, I would circle the word if. See, Jesus, what he says to people is he says, this is the truth. Take it or leave it. And, and I've been saying that the whole time. I, I, I say that on a frequent basis. You see, we don't modify the truth to suit our needs. The truth is the truth. And it's up to us to decide whether or not we surrender to it. But we don't modify the truth so that it's less offensive or, or that somehow, some way, more people will appreciate it. Because it's the truth itself that sets the captives free. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Now, if you know anything about this passage, you know that suddenly he gets immediate pushback. And he's going through, he has this dialogue with the Pharisees, who are the church leaders of the time. They don't get it. And they're actually pretty upset about it. And it, and it kind of goes on, and, and it kind of resumes, you know, we're going to resume back up in uh, verse 21. Jesus says, I am going away. You will search for me, but will die in your sin. You cannot come where I am going. The people ask, is he planning to commit suicide? What does he mean? You cannot come where I am going. Jesus continued, you are from below. I am from, abo I am from above. You belong to this world. I do not. That is why I said that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. Unless you believe that Jesus is the light of the world. So, so can you see why it's important that we understand? Jesus precedes this whole thing by saying, I am the light of the world. And then he kind of ends, he brings it full circle. It says, unless you believe that, you're not saved. It's kind of a big deal. Wouldn't you agree? I want to show you, you know... Let me kind of let me kind of set the tone for the setting of what Jesus is saying and where he's saying it because I think it's going to blow your mind. It did mine. I actually I was telling the the people this morning. I, I, every so often I get these epiphanies in Scripture, and uh, you know obviously I, I credit the Holy Spirit for that. But I got something this morning that I didn't even. I just it was like, wow. So I want to share that with you. I don't know if you'll be as excited about it as I am. I hope so. If you're not, just keep it to yourself. <laughs> but, to, okay, so, what's the setting? You know, if you ever kind of wonder, you know, how we put these messages together and uh, all this stuff, and uh, they call this hermeneutics, and, you know, so you have this text. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. What's the setting for which he's saying that? Does that have significance? Yes, it does. Let me take you back for just a minute. I want to take you back to, the, to Isaiah. In Isaiah 42, uh, there's, there's this great passage. Now, if you know anything about Isaiah, 
you know that Isaiah was written over 700 years before the birth of Jesus. So here we go. So Isaiah, um, it says, verse 5, uh, 40, 42 verse 5, it says, God the Lord created the heavens and stretched them out. He created the earth and everything in it. He gives breath to everyone, life to everyone who walks the earth. And it is he who says, I the Lord have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. I will take you by the hand and guard you. I will give you my people Israel as a symbol of my covenant with them. And you will be a light to guide the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons. Who's God talking to? Well, the Jews believed that to be the Messiah, this anointed one that was revealed throughout the Old Testament. This is messianic prophecy. And so they're expecting this, this anointed one to come, this anointed one of God, and it says that you'll be a light to the nations. And so, and so they had this, this connection between light and God, and it was going on and went all the way back to the Exodus. If you follow the Exodus, when they began, it goes all the way back to creation. We saw that last week in Genesis. But in the Exodus, they had God leading them. And how did he lead them? As an illuminated pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. And he led them through the wilderness. They literally followed the light. And then as it continues forward, we have this Isaiah prophecy. Let's jump ahead to Isaiah 49. We have the same prophecy in Isaiah 49. Again, this is messianic prophecy. It says, verse 5, And now the Lord speaks to the one who formed me in my mother's womb to be his servant. Sounds a little bit like Christmas, the Christmas story, doesn't it? It says, he who commissioned me to bring Israel back to him. It says, the Lord has honored me and my God has given me strength. He says, you will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. I will make you a light to the Gentiles. And you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. The Lord, my Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, says to the one who is despised and rejected by the nations, to the one who is the servant of rulers, kings will stand at attention when you pass by. Princes will also bow low because of the Lord, the faithful one, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. At just the right time I will respond to you. On the day of salvation I will help you. I will protect you and give you to the people as my, uh, to the people as my covenant with them. Through you I will reestablish the land of Israel and assign it to its own people again. I will say to the prisoners, come out of freedom and to those in darkness, come into the light. All this, this picture of this Messiah. Now fast forward to the birth of Jesus. Jesus walking the earth. Uh, kind of the setting of John chapter 8. You've got to go to John chapter 7. This is where the epiphany begins. You see, they were heading to Jerusalem. And they were heading for the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is a feast that God implemented to the Jews to commemorate their wandering through the wilderness. After the Exodus, where they followed the light. Now, what did they do as part of the festival? Well, they called it the great illumination of the temple. And so the great illumination of the temple, what they would do is they had four massive menorahs that have seven torches on each one. Uh, according to the historians and, and early uh, ra rabbinical, rabbinical writings, these things were... 75 feet high. I mean, they're just massive. And what they would do, if you understand the layout of the temple, you'd walk into the temple, and the first courtyard would be the courtyard of the women. Because outside of the main temple courtyard was the court of the Gentiles. They didn't allow Gentiles in there. But the first section is for women. The next section is where all the sacrifices came. Well, as you walked into the section, the main entrance into the temple, there would be these massive menorahs. There are four of them. And these things, when they illuminated the temple, you could see them for miles and miles away. 
And this is the setting where Jesus walks in and he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. And some got it and some didn't. I mean, it's almost like, you know, sometimes it's like God is just screaming. He's just yelling. He's like, what do I have to do to get people to understand? How about some 75-foot candelabras? And how about uh, illuminating the temple? And how about I lead them through the wilderness and I become a a pillar of fire at night and I, I do all these things in the midst of darkness. I give messianic prophecy. When Jesus comes into the world, he's referred to as light, 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 light. And for so many Christians, all light is Christmas lights. It's about being led out of the darkness. It's about being led into the truth of who God is. It's about being led into the truth of who we are. And Jesus says, if you follow me. I find it fascinating. The more that I research and the more that I study and the more the Holy Spirit brings these things to mind, the more I'm just amazed that I walked years of my life and I didn't have a clue. I had the veil. And Christmas would come, and it was just all about shopping. It was about movies. It was about, you know, you know, I always loved Christmas Day. It was good family time. And all those things are good. But I never, ever, ever associated God himself coming in to my dark world and saying, Steve, follow me. I want to set you free. You are a prisoner to darkness. And I've made a way for you to walk in the light. It never occurred to me all those years. Now, if it occurred to you, great. But it never did me. And so I, I, you know, when I read, when I go back to our 1 Corinthians text, and and, and, um, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians, when I go back to that text, and I think about this veil, I don't know about you, but a couple things happened in my life. Number one, I am thankful that this veil has been removed. But number two, my heart goes out to those who still have the veil. I hope it does you too. I hope that as you go through Christmas, if you have an understanding of what it all means, somewhere in the midst of all that, in the back of your mind, there's a realization that most people don't. They're still in darkness. And when, they, when tragedy strikes, and I, I don't know the faith of the people that, that were at the Walmart. I don't, I mean, I don't know. My understanding was there was a beautiful article in uh, the, the, the register today, and I, you know, of course, I, well, I'm here, I'm here early. I don't get to read any of that, but my understanding was there was an article, about, and one of the people was, had, had a very, very good faith. And I do know that they're going to need it. The family will need it. How can you not, uh, you know, when tragedy like this happens, how can you not just feel like an emptiness when somebody's not at the table on Christmas Day? Well, you understand that If you're a person of faith, you give thanks because the veil has been lifted and you know that that person, though the chair may be empty, they're on a different chair in heaven. And you thank God for it. See, this this is where the light comes in. You see, if that was all there was, then how tragic would it be? But when you think about the fact that this person and anybody who is in Christ that has passed away, while we may miss them, they're having the greatest Christmas experience we could, we could ever even possibly imagine. And so that brings us back to our text. So it begins, uh, this, this Corinthians text, it says, Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, this new way, uh, you know, the, always, the old saying is, is, whenever you see the word therefore, 
figure out what it's there for. You ever heard that? So he, Paul begins that chapter by saying, therefore, he's talking about this new way, this new ministry, this new, uh, the gospel, the good news. Now what he does is he contrasts the covenant of Moses. In, in chapter 3, he talks about the covenant of Moses. The covenant of Moses was when God gave us the law. Now, if you've heard me talk about the law versus the Spirit, the law is not there to give us life. The law is there to point us to Jesus. You don't get righteousness through the law. Uh, that's why, you know, obviously we, we seek righteousness. As, as Christians, we should be seeking holiness, not cheapening grace. But we don't get any righteousness through our works. So he contrasts this in chapter 3. He talks about this new covenant through Jesus Christ. How Jesus made this way. He came into this world. One of the ways in which he was light is by he became the sacrifice for our sins. So it says, therefore, since God has made, has, in his mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the Word of God. It's not our responsibility to make people believe. You don't have to water down the Gospel. You don't have to somehow, someway avoid all the juicy parts and just kind of omit those. You can boldly, unapologetically tell the truth. But always do it wrapped in love. That's, that was kind of the epitome of Jesus. It says that we don't try to trick anyone to, or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God. And all who are honest know this. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Do you ever stop to think, as tragic as some deaths are in this world, you know there's a greater tragedy. It's for people to die not knowing Jesus. I think that, you know, we kind of can gloss over that. But if we're, if we're truly concerned about it, I, I've always told this, I've told this story before, I'll tell it again. I remember a uh, listening to uh, an atheist uh, who was saying, and of course, he didn't believe any of this, but one of the things that he said to Christians, he said, you know, he says, if you truly believed what this said, you wouldn't be able to sleep at night knowing full well that the people you love, if they have not heard the gospel, if they have not seen the light, you, you, you wouldn't be able to live with yourself until you had told everybody about the light. And so this is this, this is this picture. This should be driving us. This should be challenging us to share the truth and the light with people. Now here's the, here's the good news. This is a work of God. So we, we can't really make a judgment on exactly what happened. I, I've told this story before. I had a I had an uncle that, um, that passed away, and before he passed away, he just completely lambasted me for my faith. Just totally objected it. Just was, matter of fact, he was actually really upset about my faith. And then shortly thereafter, he died. He had a heart attack, and he died. And, his, and his, uh, my aunt, his wife, came to me the next time I saw her. She came to me, and she said, so I suppose you believe that that your uncle is in hell right now. And I said to her, I said, I don't, I have no idea where he's at. But I do know that if he's in heaven, it's because he saw the light of Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. And she said, well, I don't believe that happened. I go, well, I, I guess we'll find out. But I, I'm going to believe that that is what happened until I know otherwise. But see, he 
we see how these things make their connection uh, and how if we kind of we kind of gloss it over or somehow make it something other than it is before long these lies that they affect what we believe Paul goes on to say if the good news we preach is hidden by the veil it's hidden only from people who are perishing Satan who is the god of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe they're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ who is the exact likeness of God. That's a way of saying that Jesus is God. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. I've got nothing to tell you about me. What we preach about is the Word of God and about Jesus Christ. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. God made this light shine in our hearts. God lifted the veil of understanding. You see, I would tell people, if you're here today, and, and, and if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but yet you, you want to, you appeal to God. You appeal to God to lift the veil, uh, to, to bring light into your heart. Now, now, at the end of the service, I mean, we always br- invite people to come forward, and people would love to pray for you. But you don't have to come forward. You can pray that anytime, anywhere that you are. You just invite Jesus Christ, invite the light into your life. And you surrender your life to the Lord. It says, now we have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. We are imperfect vessels. But at one, as one uh, commentator explained, the interesting thing about a fragile clay jar is the more that it's cracked and damaged, the more light shines through those cracks and that damage. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. You know, there's really no greater witness than a person who's experienced this. You know, a lot of people like to kind of put up a good front. And they never want to admit their weaknesses. They never want to admit their struggles. And so they create this image. They create this, you know, last night, I don't know, I I, I mean, I I always watch the edited version. You know, it's been a long time. but, But I always watch Christmas Vacation this time of year. Right? And you know Clark, poor old Clark, he's trying to have the perfect family Christmas, right? And he's always trying to, you know, it's just everything. He just tries so hard. And every time he tries, he fails. And the more he fails, the more frustrated he gets. And it's just his whole, it's his whole movie until at the end, he just flips out. Right? What's interesting is, is the perfect Christmas, it's not about perfection about imperfection see that's why we need the light try to put up all these false fronts and have all these perfect settings and you know if you could pull that off god bless you that's awesome go for it but in the midst of all of that perfection is the reality that marriages are breaking up there's a reality that finances are deteriorating there's a reality that relationships are not working. I came from one of those families that come Christmas, boy, we, you know, everything looked perfect. But behind the scenes, there's all this stuff going on. You know, people that are in ministry, we know all too well, this is the time of year where it just, things unravel. And I want to tell you that, you know, if you really want to embrace the light this year, you know, you don't, All you have to do is just be honest and truthful. 
You don't have to the pressure of putting up a false front. You see, Paul, after all this text, he goes into this picture, and, and as I read this, I read this out through chapter 4, I'm just going to read it. I want you to have this picture of uh, the wilderness and God leading us through the wilderness. I mean, that wilderness must have been pretty chaotic. It was a desert, right? They had no idea where they were going, but they did have the light of God leading them. That's why it says, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, starting with verse 8, he says, we're pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. Though through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death, because we serve Jesus, so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. We continue to, but we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit, and as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be a great thanksgiving, and God will receive more and more glory. That's why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits will be renewed every day, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. We don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. This is a time of year where we get fixated on the things that we can see. And somewhere in the midst of this fixation, we need to be reminded there are amazing things that we cannot see, but someday... We'll see them forever and ever. Uh, it's corporate communion day today. And there's probably no greater thing that's all about what we can't see, but it symbolizes this hope of what will be forever someday. So we come before here, and for a lot of people, this is, I don't know, maybe this is a religious ritual. Uh, what's up with the bread and the juice? What is up with that? I don't get it. But, you know, everybody's going up, so I'll go up. Or, there's a deeper meaning. It's this meaning of, you know what, I don't know how it works. But somehow, amazingly, by the power of the Holy Spirit, through my faith in Jesus Christ, I am communing with Jesus Christ, the light of the world. As I come forward, I don't necessarily know. I know that I am this imperfect vessel. I am this fragile clay jar. But I do know that Jesus is the light of the world. And he says, if I follow him, I will never have to dwell in darkness. And I will not die in my sins. So as I come forward, I'm praying for illumination. I'm praying for the veil to be lifted. And for the distance between me and the resurrected Jesus Christ to be smaller, so that I can be near him. That's communion. So we're going to invite you to partake in that. Before we do that, I'm going to pray for us. So would you join me in prayer? Father God, I thank you for your word today. And Lord, I do thank you for this picture of light. Uh, it's not something that we have to manufacture, but as we follow you, as we put our trust in you, and as we, as, we, as we just believe in what you've said, Lord, your light invades our hearts. And not only that, but it radiates. It radiates out of ours. So Lord, I just pray now in this time of communion that whatever it is that uh, tries to draw us into darkness, whatever foothold Satan has over our lives, whether it be through sin or whether it be through lies, Lord. I pray that those things would be driven out, they'd be cast out, and that we would be drawn to the truth 
we would be drawn to your light, Lord, and that this communion, this sign of, of your new covenant, Lord, it would bless us and it would strengthen us and would help us to be the people that you've called us to be. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So I want to urge you, if you are a person who has a loved one who doesn't get it, I want to guide you in a way to pray. Pray, Lord, would you lift the veil? And would you invade their life with your light? May they see. See, I've got people. Every year, on my prayer list, I have these people in my life. I'm just praying for them. Now, I, you know, maybe on the surface, that can sound a little arrogant, I guess. Lord, you know, would you please help my husband to see the light? Well, maybe if he's not saved. But I want to urge you as, you, as you go through and, you know, understand, I didn't get it. I haven't always gotten it. I'm in the process of understanding more and more. We're all in that place. But not everybody has started the journey. So I want to, I just want to, I want you to be ready to be ambassadors of light as you go out there. And it's okay if you don't have all the answers. That's sometimes the best testimony. It's just to look at people and say, you know what, I'm not perfect. I don't have all the answers. But I do know that I've seen the light. And I'm following Jesus. See, that's a great testimony. So I want to urge you as you go to allow the light of Christ to follow you. Would you please stand receive this blessing as you do leave here and you go about your lives this week. Be light. And leave now knowing the love of God the Father, the grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ the Son and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit now and always. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great week.